Welcome, everybody. I'm Alana Weston, Chairman of Selfridges Group, and um, I'm delighted to have with me today some of the leading lights in the fight against climate change. Each member of this panel is using his or her influence in very different ways to tackle what we now know is an existential threat to humanity. So I'd like to introduce John Sovin, the executive director of Greenpeace. We also have Christiana Figueres, former executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, co-founder of Global Optimism, and the co-author of the best-selling book, The Future We Choose, Surviving the Climate Crisis. Also, Farhana Yaman, an internationally recognized environmental lawyer, climate change and development policy expert. Farhana has advised leaders and countries for 20 years. She also played a role in the Extinction Rebellion protests in 2019. And finally, Paul Van Zyl, who served as executive secretary of the Post-Apartheid Truth and Reconciliation Commission and is founder and creative officer of the Conduit Club, which aims to bring change makers together to solve real world issues. So thank you very much for all being here this evening. And so for myself, I, I came to activism after a conversation with a scientist friend of mine about the possibilities of selling solutions to conservation issues. And that conversation became Project Ocean, which we launched at Selfridges in 2011. And since then, uh, we've been working to drive sustainability to the heart of our business strategy. But we would never have got as far as Project Earth without these important conversations we've had with the NGO community, activists and scientists who've educated us and inspired us but also act as what you might call critical friends. And, um, and I must admit that um, personally, I, I think probably the activist is larger than the business person in my soul. And, um, and they too often cr crash into each other. Um, but um, but I, I thought um, I'd ask each of you, if you could very briefly tell us what made you an activist? And um, if that's actually how you describe yourself. Um, Farhan, would you like to start? Yeah, I became an activist when I was 13, 14, and I was very active in the Rock Against Racism. So this is back in the 70s and early 80s. Um, and very active in the feminist movement and very active in the peace movement. I joined CND. And actually, for me, I put all of those aside and stopped being an activist when I started studying law, basically after school and channeled all my energy into my professional life as an environmental lawyer. So I'm rediscovering my activist self and how important it is to, to be out there on the streets and to be part of social movements. That's great. And John, tell us a bit of your story. Um, well, you, you're going to be able to tell our age now uh, as well by our stories if you're asking us how we came into activism. But I, I, I look, my my a bit like for Hannah, really. I mean, my uh, entry into activism came when I was a, a student at university in the 70s. I joined something called Student Community Action. Uh, and we actually we set up a school for gypsy and traveler children. It was funded by Save the Children. And, it, you know, it was very interesting because, of course, there was a, a, a 19... Uh, 44 Education Act, which said everybody, every child had a right to secondary education. It was in law. Yet there was a whole group of marginalized people that were denied access to education. And it kind of led me to understand a bit more about power and politics, uh, treatment of different communities, the racism, the discrimination. Uh, and of course, you know, as a student, and uh, you know, then you also get involved in other things. Of course, the anti-apartheid movement was very big and very strong then. Uh, and I suppose, you know, the informal education that we had in terms of our activism, uh, our understanding of, of, of politics and power really grew out of at that time and then involved many different 
uh, struggles and, and issues like like with Fahana. And, and I suppose that's the sad thing about COVID and what's going on at the moment in our universities with students is that that aspect is, is very much curtailed. And I, I always think that's such an important part of being young and growing up and, and going into further education or other walks of life is, is having that time and ability and space to, to be able to do those kinds of things. Yeah. And Paul, do you consider yourself an activist? And if so, how did it all start? I absolutely consider myself an activist. I mean, I, I went to a university in South Africa in the, in the mid-1980s at the height of the anti-apartheid struggle. Um, you know, the black student activists who I was working with at the time, I remember very vividly one morning, you know, asking where three or four of the more senior activists were, and they'd been picked up at three o'clock in the morning by the security police, detained without trial, subsequently discovered extraordinarily badly tortured. Um, I started working with a young lawyer um, who was doing death penalty work, a young black lawyer, um, who was assassinated by the security police. And then I started working uh, with mothers whose children had been abducted and disappeared and assassinated uh, under apartheid and sat with them in church basements and tried to gather them together to advocate for both truth and justice. Um, and so, you know, slightly common thread, um, you know, uh, got an activist experience early on, um, had the great privilege of being involved in, I think, one of the great struggles of our time, which um, ended uh, with you know Nelson Mandela in power and Desmond Tutu working at the Truth Commission. So, um, and I think from then I have um, I have never um, turned back from trying to see how you can make the world both more just and more democratic, but I think in latterly um, you know also more sustainable in a place that we can um, bequeath to future generations, um, knowing that we acted responsibly while we could. Thank you. Christiana. Um, yeah, I also consider myself, sorry. I was just going to say, how do you see your role as an activist? Yeah. Well, um, I also consider myself an activist, although I think a little bit unusually. Um, I also started my understanding of climate change rooted in science, Alain, a lot similar to you, because uh, in my very early years of being a mother, I witnessed the disappearance of the golden toad in Costa Rica in 1989 to go back to uh, the point that you're aging us when you ask us to go to figure out where do we, where do we come from? Um, and uh, I was really, I, I was shocked. I was shocked that I had witnessed the extinction of one species in a few short years. And I definitely realized that that meant that many other species were clearly disappearing and that I decided I had to do something about that. So the first thing that I did is I worked with governments and had the total pleasure of working with Parhana alongside shoulder to shoulder because we were both representing governments in the international negotiations. I then also formed an NGO and was delighted to work shoulder to shoulder with so many NGOs, including Greenpeace way back in Kumi Naidu's time. Um, and then I added to that, piled on to that, working with corporations because clearly they have a huge responsibility in their emissions and a huge possibility in their emission reductions. So all three basic constituencies that can really help uh, to get to where we need to in addressing climate change. And so today I actually see myself as a continual um, activist, but for no particular constituency. Rather, I, I identify my one and only boss as being the global atmosphere, and I consider myself an activist for her, pushing and prodding all constituencies to do much better than what they're doing right now. Fantastic, fantastic stories. So I, I have a question for each of you, which I thought could kind of frame our discussion in the second half, but um, I'm gonna start with Farhana. So you're an environmental lawyer and it also you know, involved in intergovernmental negotiations and the, and the lead author on key reports for the IPCC. And yet you're involved with Extinction Rebellion and even I think have glued yourself to the side of the shell offices. 
How do you manage to tread this line between making and breaking the law in order to protect the planet? I think it's uh, drawing on a huge um, number of social movements who always use all different techniques and strategies, including sometimes having to break the law in a peaceful way and sometimes in a violent way. There were many, many strategy disputes in the apartheid movement, in the feminist movement. We had the suffragettes who took direct action, broke windows, threw themselves in front of horses, went on hunger strikes. So the full plethora of techniques and strategies have always been used by people when they're faced with structural, systemic and ongoing uh, 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 you know, oppression, which cannot be addressed on a piecemeal basis through the courts or through the changes in one law or another. And actually climate change is now reached the maturity and understanding where we realise you can't just fix this with a, a sort of carbon tax or just with a tweak to a, a regulation here and there. It involves every single person, involves every single sector, involves every single human being. And that's why, um, you know, I felt at the time um, when I did that, that action, I joined XR at the end of 2018 when they first were not heard, of, heard about. No one had heard of them, actually. Um, when I was facing a really bleak time and I, I felt that the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees, which was a, a, a measure of global uh, minimum safety for the islands and the vulnerable countries I'd represented, that had been included in the Paris Agreement as a global reference point, along with the wording of well below two degrees. That had taken a decade to get into the Paris Agreement. Like I was there with Christiana, actually, again, you know, we go way back to 1991, slightly longer than 30 years of advising and being uh, government negotiators. And it took the island countries and vulnerable countries and the scientists 10 years to get that report. Because uh, when I was acting for the Maldives president in 2009, that was the single biggest demand in Copenhagen, which collapsed. And so for me, it was very personal when the Paris Accord included that reference point and when the IPCC report in 2018, 10 years after Copenhagen, said this is the right threshold and even at this threshold there will be massive consequences. And I felt the right response to that report, to that finding, to that acknowledgement was to take much you know, more concerted action than I saw other NGOs and other social movements and other politicians acting it was brilliant you know petitions briefings and so forth but actually extinction rebellion uh, and greta thunberg was there uh, at, at, in october in parliament square and actually people got themselves arrested they were willing to say i will lay my liberty my life and my body on the line because this is the gravity of the moment that we find ourselves in and i'm very sad to say that you know i felt I had to turn my back on the global diplomatic community, which at that time was in real doldrums, um, you know, dealing with yet another global political sort of crisis of then the Trump administration and a number of other governments turning their back on the science. So I felt we have to do something much more dramatic. And what can that be? And learn from lots of social movements. So I think this is not a surprise um, that, you know, at times, uh, movements uh, have to turn to the full gamut of uh, resources and call on people to, to, to literally put their bodies on the line. And it's what southern defenders of nature have been doing for decades and often faced with bullets and guns and a death toll against, you know, very uh, uh, deadly, uh, uh, you know, uh, deadly levels of violence against them, you know. So I felt for me as a relatively privileged person as a mother of four children. The first one was born just before COP1 and she's now 26. My child who was born, who I had to leave as a five month old to attend that first conference that Christiana and I negotiated at is 26 year old, 26 year old. And I feel a personal responsibility as a mother now to speak up, not just as a lawyer, not just as a diplomat. Um, so yeah, that's why I, joined thousands of others to to um, get arrested and to say I was willing to to pay that penalty and that price and you know Paul yeah. is there my husband actually is South African and 
his family too have been part and parcel of the, uh, you know, the anti-apartheid struggle, which was truly global and involved many, many different people making those ultimate sacrifices. And we've learned a lot of lessons from that movement. So yeah, that was my explanation. And I think it worked. It worked, basically. Well, that's what I was going to ask, Christiane. I mean, you've you've both worked very closely together behind the closed doors as well. And I I wanted to ask Christiana, you know, as as an insider, as a diplomat, um, but also now especially a very public campaigner, can you tell us how what the public are saying and doing influences what goes on in those rooms and when it comes to international negotiations on climate policy? Does it make a difference? It does make a difference, and Farhana has been very eloquent about it. The the fact is, when you look at history, um, yes, there are some social and political and economic changes that have occurred in history, but none of the big ones have occurred without civil disobedience. That is for sure. And what is very interesting is that when you look at the numbers, civil disobedience, A, occurs when there is a sense that the social injustice that is occurring is simply no longer tolerable. And the other thing that's very interesting is that once civil disobedience gets to 3.5% of the particular population, in this case, it would have to be global population, but at very least in industrialized and the major developing countries, 3.5% of the population is the magical number, at least historically, that changes the, um, the, the sentiment politically. And so that's very interesting because 3.5% of any population of every country is doable, right? It is totally doable. Now, are people listening already even before we get to 3.5%? Absolutely. I am impressed at how many CEOs that I speak to tell me, wow, the young people, we are listening to them, whether it is the young people in the streets or whether it's their own young children. We're asking them at night, dad, mom, what are you doing about my future? They're beginning to listen to that voice more than to all of us adults screaming and yelling. That is fantastic. I also hear from many CEOs that what they're really concerned about, especially in the oil and gas companies, they're really concerned about the fact that the best and the brightest brains, which are the young brains, because our brains are already losing their neurons, but the best and the brightest brains are definitely still young brains. That's where it is. And oil and gas CEOs are concerned that they're not being able to attract the best and the brightest because young people don't want to sell their brains to companies that are irresponsible. And so I think that especially young people have a huge amount of leverage and a huge amount of capacity here to accelerate, force, push, prod, use whatever verb you want, um, but to, to really get us to the top of the hill and then be able to uh, to bend the curve into the action that we need. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think as a as a business person, absolutely, we know you know we're interested in what the customer feels. We're interested in what our employees feel, and and um, and it, it just it makes complete sense. Um, and I think a lot of us stand aside and wonder why why politicians don't seem to be able to see. The world that way too, and um, and you and I have, have discussed that at length. But um, but tell me, John, um, it feels like activism today is more complex than it was um, maybe when you guys got started. I mean, you know, there, it feels like, and I think this is a good thing that that there are more stakeholders included. Um, and um, you've worked directly with businesses to transform their supply chains and also leverage their media voice to campaign for change. I'm, I'm thinking of your work in palm oil in particular. But um, and yet, and yet, Greenpeace has maintained its its street cred, so to speak, um, through the direct action that you were talking about earlier. You know, these boulders that you're throwing into the sea at the moment. So how do you how do you balance both approaches within one organization? And um, and how does one, um, you know, the fact that you do have the ear of CEOs, um, but also you do you are able to marshal 
um, the, the voice of the street um, and the media. Um, how do these things um, uh, how do these things work together? Mm. I, I mean, look, that's a very interesting question. I think, you know, first of all, just picking up on on things that Fahana and Christiana have said is, look, I, I think when you look at how environmental activism has changed over time, I think that there's no question about it, as you as you said, Lana, that the, the issues have perhaps become more complex in the, in the sense that when you were, say, looking at some of the battles that, you know, some of the battles that I've been involved in in my time at Greenpeace, for example, protecting the ozone layer, it meant getting rid of one set of chemicals that was destroying the ozone layer and replacing them with another. Now, of course, the chemical industry didn't like it, but technically it was possible to do it. And it wasn't that hard a decision, for example, for politicians to come together and sign the Montreal Protocol that, 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 um, that got rid of those chemicals at the end of the 80s. I think you can say that there are similar things, like, for example, the ban on leaded petrol. All we were really asking uh, and there was, was, of course, all the science and everything else that was that was backing that up in terms of the health impacts. All you were asking was for the lead to be taken out of the petrol. You know, it was it was a, a relatively easy thing to do in terms of uh, what might happen in a refinery. Of course, what we're asking now to have happen is not for the lead to be taken out of the petrol, but for the petrol to be taken out of the system. Now, that's a whole different ball game. Because now you're coming up against the fossil fuel industry, and the fossil fuel industry is the biggest and most powerful uh, industry in the world. It's it completely is a revolving door between uh, 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 government and business. It's used all its power and all its might to try and first of all fund climate skepticism, uh, then fund campaigns against uh, regulations, and then fund campaigns, you know, through its lobbying and its the, the muscle that it has in terms of getting international agreements and so on. And then when all of that sort of failed, because of course Paris was a, a, a great success, it then went into a situation where, for example, some oil companies with their capital expenditure would invest 1% in renewable energy and 99% in fossil fuels, but 100% of their marketing and advertising was about renewable energy. And, you know, if you were coming from another planet and looking at their advertising, you'd think they were 100% renewable energy companies. It was all just greenwash. And so I think what we're into a phase now, which I suppose is an interesting phase, where a lot of these things are now being exposed. They're now far more transparent. I think people, partly just because they're just living the impacts. You know, if you're living right now in California, or you're living in, in, in Brazil in the Amazon, or you're living recently, for example, in, in, in Paraguay, large chunks of these countries are on fire. Uh, you know, and I think everywhere people are seeing the, the, the droughts, the floods, the melting ice caps and so on. So and I John suppose the Surrey, chicken... Surrey was on fire just a, just a few months ago. <laughs> exactly. and nobody so the, noticed. So it, I, I mean, I but, spend the weekend the there. We were on fire. But the chickens are coming home to roost. So I yeah. suppose this is where, you know, in a way, it, it's interesting, this journey now, because if you say, take our, you know, I mean, I, I, I had, a, for example, a conversation with Bernard Looney, the CEO uh, of BP in our office the other week. And, you know, it was interesting because we'd fought a big battle against BP for a long time. I, you know, I was threatened uh, earlier this year with two years in prison for, for breaking an injunction against an action we did against BP's oil rig where they're trying to drill for new oil in the North Sea. And you go from that situation to they're sitting in your office. Now, why are they sitting in your office? Well, because they've come up with a new plan, you know, two and a half gigawatts of renewable energy. They now say they want 50 gigawatts by 2030. They're now talking about cutting oil and gas production by 40% by 2030. No oil company has talked about these things in those terms. And I think also, as Christiana said, you know, the other things they are talking about, they can't attract young people. Who wants to go and work for a company that is the equivalent of the tobacco company? You know, when you've got all of these smart, new, successful, high-tech companies that are now coming uh, online, you know, and, and just look at the share price. The share price of BP and Shell this year is down 50%. You look at tiny little offshore wind companies like Orsted, they're worth almost as much. You look at Tesla, an EV company, it's worth more, I think, than all of the other car companies put together. You know, you know, th this is, these are quite systemic changes, and it's that sort of systemic change that, that we're talking about. 
but do we still need activism? A hundred percent, because I don't think anybody here would deny it. we're not on track. We are not no. anywhere near under two degrees heading for one and a half. We're, te- we're heading towards three degrees plus. This is a complete catastrophe for the planet. So we need absolutely more activism uh, and we need to put the boulders that we're putting in the North Sea to protect marine protected areas at the moment. We need to put those in quite a few other places as well on a quite a number of other issues if we're really going to get to where we need to get to. And in the time frame, because I think everyone is talking about 2050 net zero or 2060 net zero, as President she announced at the UN the other day. But what counts is what we do today, what we do in the next 10 years. So it's the immediate action that we need. Not It's great that they're talking about doing this in 30 or 40 years' time, but only if they're going to act today. And that's um, to say, you know, everyone listening is 2030 is the new 2050, and that means every decision today and tomorrow has to be very different. So yeah. I, I feel like we all play a different role trying to get 2050 date into Paris and into national, you know, legislation and into the national action plans. But it's it's really all about 2030, and that means changing things today and tomorrow. I, you know, ideally, it would have been ten years ago, but we've lost a decade due to lots of factors. Sorry to butt in, but that's my new phrase. You know, twenty twenty thirties and new twenty fifty. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, Paul. Um, you know, you're a lawyer and a business person, um, and an activist. I mean, um, and everything you've done in both fields has always been aligned around your purpose. Um. Can you, um, you know, what do you see as the role of business in activism? And, and what kind of conversations are, are happening now that maybe weren't going on five years ago or when you started thinking of, of setting up the Conduit Club? Well, maybe it's sort of a, t- a tiny piece of kind of history because it, help us, it helps inform us. I mean, one of the kind of, th- one of the philosophies that both Mandela and Tutu uh, espouse that I'm particularly uh, fond of is this idea of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu is an African philosophy which indicates that you are who you are through your connections to others. And it is the community and the group and a sense of interdependence and a sense of mutuality and a sense of mutual obligation that gives us meaning. Um, and, you know, if you think for a moment, All the great strides that have happened in the world have happened as a result of people acting in groups. And all the moments of the greatest amount of happiness and joy you have had are most likely when you've been with other people, not sitting on your own. So I think there's an enormous strength um, and an enormous sense of power about thinking about people in groups. And one of the reasons why we established The Conduit is to try and bring together people who are passionate about positive social change and and embody Ubuntu, have people who are activists, have people who have resources, have people who are investors, have people who are entrepreneurs, have people who are policymakers, have people who are researchers, who have, uh, who have mapped out the pathways to change. And then to say something that we all share is that there is, for the first time in human history, we are out of time. We have to act urgently. Every moment that we waste makes it twice as hard to achieve the same goals. And this is a moment that is pregnant with purpose, right? So on the great struggles of our time, race and racism, we are still in the heart of that struggle. Climate is absolutely essential. Inequality is getting worse. And so we have big, big struggles in front of us. And then we have enormous possibility. We have... Uh, breakthroughs in science, we have advances in technology, we have the ability to deploy capital. Um, We have a sense right now as a result of COVID, but of climate as well, of a fierce ability to mobilize the street. And I think what it really, um, what this moment requires, and it stems from my experience in the anti-apartheid struggle, which was Mandela used to say, we need an all of the above strategy to get rid of the scourge. We need to go We need people on the street. We need people to stop rugby players coming into the country. We need to isolate this from sanctions. But we also need 
quiet, careful diplomatic negotiations behind closed doors. We need to bring recalcitrant whites on a journey. We have to take big business that benefits from mines and show them that they're another economy that is works for everybody as it is just for everybody. And so I think <clears throat> these moments require a synchronization. It requires the street. It requires the insider's game. It requires working at the pinnacle of power. It requires working with the excluded. Um, and I think that's what I, what I think is interesting, is to be able to hold people's feet to the fire and then to show them the promised land and to say, mm -hmm. I'm not just going to beat you with a stick. I'm not just going to wag my finger. I'm also going to say there's solutions. And those for business are solutions that are more profitable will be better for your share price, better for your stakeholders, better for your employees, better for your for the planet, and frankly, better for your conscience. Um, mm. And and it's possible. So, you know, I think one of the, the things that I'm left with is um, the anti-apartheid struggle infects you with optimism because we won. Uh, my home country has many challenges that remain, and you should never declare victory too early in any struggle. Um, but on the other hand, I think it, it, it caused me to believe that there isn't a struggle that can't be won if you are prepared to play a multi-stakeholder, sophisticated inside-outside game. Um, and I think that is what's required. But, you know, the good news is also what is possible at this moment. And, um, and I wanted to ask... Um you know, there seems like there's terrific energy and, and everybody's commented on it, whether it's Greta, XR, you know, Blue Planet, all of these things coming together have made a huge difference. But um, is there a risk that we face campaign fatigue? Is there a risk that all these voices and all these causes, um, you know, eventually that the public and policymakers become somehow deaf? I mean, I'm hoping the answer is no, but I'm wondering how do you maintain the energy and the interest in this, in, especially when we're faced with things like COVID and economic um, disruption and, and, and other things? What's, what's, what keeps the fire alive? Chris Chana? Um, well, Honestly, I do think that there are many moments in which we're all fatigued. So let's not pretend like that is not happening because uh, we've all been at this for such a long time. And there are moments in which we are simply burned out. And I think it's very important for all activists to be mindful of self and of others and realize when are we just about to go into burnout and take some time off. Take some time off to go to nature, to play with children, to, you know, hike in the mountains, to swim in the oceans, whatever is important, because we do have to regenerate our commitment to this. So I think that is one thing um, that we should not turn our backs to. And that is a regeneration that sometimes comes in two weeks a year or one month a year, but it's also important to do so every day, which is why I love the fact that Selfridges is talking about mindsets because the mindset with which we set our intent every single day is very important to what we're actually able to achieve that day. So regeneration of self, either, you know, or both actually, for on a yearly basis, monthly basis, but also on a daily basis. That um, I think is very important. Having said that, having said that, how can you actually succumb to paralysis, to um, indifference, to, I don't know, exhaustion, when science every day is getting more granular, more detailed, and giving us more and more information about the fact that we are not, you know, five minutes to 12, we're one minute to 12. And so the urgency that science is coming at us, constantly reminding us that we are very far behind, which is what we've been saying here, all of us, we're so far behind. And so it is that consistency of the scientific message above all that I think spurs all of us, combined with a very important focus on what is the progress that we're seeing? Yes, we're in a transition 
and every transition is messy. And you will find evidence of the yesterday that we're leaving behind in that transition, which could lead you into despair and paralysis. But if you look for it, you'll also find very important evidence of the tomorrow, of the new world that we're creating. And so we have to energize ourselves, but also making an effort to find those evidences of, you know, what is happening in the renewable energy world? What is happening in the transport world? What is happening in the land use world? What is happening with batteries? What is happening? And and be able to understand that those are seeds that are germinating, that we have to continue to water them, have to continue to water them. We can't give up because they're too fragile still. And certainly they are not taking over the planet. We can still see those examples and count them on our fingers, sadly. And that's not the point. We have to normalize this. We have to normalize low carbon and high resilience in the economy, in every sector, in every human endeavor. We we have very good examples, but we have to keep on working until we normalize it. And so given that that is the reality, how on earth can you sit back in your sofa or in your couch or wherever and um, and give in to fatigue, maybe mm-hmm. for one minute or two minutes or maybe even a week, but then get back in there. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And, um, and John, tell us how, what can people listening today, what can they do? Because I think I spoke with a fantastic young climate activist called Clover Hogan the other day, and she expressed very beautifully how how young people are feeling eco anxiety, and um, and and I think you know one of the great things is to be able to to actually grab a hold of this and do something. But a lot of people have their jobs, their kids, their lives, their you know limitations. What do you say to the to the customers of Selfridges or the you know the or the people um, around the world who are listening to this um, to this session about what they can do? And so, come yeah, I mean, I mean, look, I think just step back one minute from that in terms of the context, because I, I think one of the things is, you know, in terms of what Christian's saying is, is that we we face multiple crises, right? In in terms of COVID, in terms of the the extinction crisis, in terms of the climate crisis, you know, and I think uh, you know, as Paul has adequately said, there are also issues out there which are also linked to this in terms of growing inequality and other issues, for example, racism. So one of the things that I think is really important to understand is that these issues are interlinked. I mean, where does COVID come from? COVID comes from the trade in in wildlife, in wild animals. It comes from our encroachment into ecosystems which are being destroyed. I mean, you know, that's the, the origin of Ebola, HIV, and so on. The destruction of the Amazon and other rainforests is just going to lead to more pandemics. It also comes out of our industrial meat system. You know, that's where swine flu and everything else has come from. So when you say, oh, we, we have a health crisis, we have to prioritize the health crisis in our response to COVID. I said, well, you don't actually, you have, a, you have an ecological crisis of which this is the health component of it. Because the solution to this health crisis and the pandemics that we have had and will have more in the future is actually the protection of wilderness, is that actually protecting our rainforests. And by doing that, you protect biodiversity and you also protect the climate. And so I think that what we need to do when we look at these issues is, is look at them as a whole. And when you look at what the governments are doing now in response to COVID, because before, of course, Government said, oh, climate change, that's too difficult, too expensive. Uh, we'll deal with that in a decade or two's time or whatever else it is. You now find governments are doing things in weeks that they said could not be done in decades in terms of the action they're taking, the money that they're spending, the action that's being galvanized around the world in terms of the production of vaccines and so on and so forth. So I think it's proved the lie in a way that when political leaders, when governments want to act in the time of crisis, they can do so. All we're saying is you can have three and one. Why deal with one and not deal with the other two when they're interrelated? That's just going to cost you three times as much, three times as long, and guarantees that all three fail. So, you know, to a certain extent, it's it's a no-brainer. Any rational 
human being would understand that. And of course, you know, Trump in the US and Bolsonaro and Brazil and so on don't understand it. But most rational human beings understand that. And I suppose that's when it comes down, well, okay, well, what can the individual do? Well, if I was in the United States, I would definitely have a job to do for the next uh, four weeks uh, in terms of, you know, because political leaders do make a big difference. You, you know, it, you know that I think we now do understand, uh, uh, you know, us going out there and voting. And, and I know at the last election in the United States, loads of people didn't vote because they didn't like Hillary Clinton. Then they got Trump and they said, oh, my God, he's a disaster. Why didn't I vote for Hillary Clinton? So, you, you know, you've got to really think this through in terms of, you know, first of all, you are a citizen. And if you live in a democracy, you need to vote. You need to be politically, politically active and engaged. And of course, you know, the second thing, I, I think which is really important is is changing the culture uh, because I think that 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 you know we are living in a in a period of time where where culture is becoming really important that we have to confront the kind of the the, the sort of extremist populist cheap kind of propaganda uh, that has led to the likes of Trump and that means that we've got to be able to respond in a way that is linking these issues, is talking about social justice, is talking about racism, is talking about inequality and so on, because we cannot solve these problems without dealing with some of these underlying issues. It's, you know, a lot of people in the past said, oh, you know, if you want to deal with poverty, you have to have growth. If you want to deal with ecology, you've got to end growth. And of course, this was taking the world in, in, in two different uh, directions where neither of them actually at the end of the day was being solved. We're having growing poverty and growing environmental degradation. So in a way, we have to rethink this and, and rethink, it, rethink it radically. And I think that's where the action of individuals, of, of activists, who, of people who will take direct action, but we're not just saying you have to take direct action. That's always going to be a minority sport. But but people can be active in a million and one ways. You know, as you know, Alana, and I think it was Anita Roddick who founded the Body Shop said, every time you buy a product, you are an activist because the decision of what you buy is is has an impact in terms of, you know, ultimately is it is it sustainable? Um, is it part of a uh, you know, a, a, a just and, and, and circular economy is it actually helping to protect the environment and encourage businesses that want to protect the environment and do good. I think it's um, before we go to questions because I want to go to questions um, shortly. Quickly, um, uh, from you, Paul, what one thing would you say people should do? We've 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 heard from John about voting and um, and making those conscious decisions. What what one thing could people do? to be an activist in their own lives? Well, I think the thing that I'm really interested in right now, and, and Christiana has sort of prompted uh, us to think about as, uh, a lot, is, is the transformation of food. And, and, and it's, you know, what you eat is a really, really important, uh, you know, a very simple thing that you can do. Not eating meat is a very simple thing. But I think the thing that gives me hope about that is there is, uh, there are not two uh, kind of, um, uh, outlandish projections that we are going to be able to develop new forms of protein in the not too distant future that are potentially going to approximate the cost of sugar. And if you think that we could achieve that through science, what we can begin to do then is think about how mass livestock and beef production and the encroachment on natural habitats and the carbon emissions and the methane and all of the things associated with that can slowly be undone. And you can begin to think of food production as something which happens in local communities. It can actually, protein can be produced in inner cities, in factories. It can be distributed directly to consumers. It can be healthy, it can be delicious, it can be materially indistinguishable from the thing that we hitherto for called meat, um, and it can start creating local employment in places that have been blighted. Um, it can be done if you think about it in a sensible way. Um, you can drive so a racial I'll, equity I'll, lens. I'm going to interrupt yeah. you there because I, I want to hear what Farhan has to say. I think food is crucial. I think food is, yeah. is one of the most important things we can do and the easiest for each of us to do. Farhana. 
no thank you and, and and thank you to paul as well for you know so one of the things that i've been trialing is what does a solution based movement that is hyper local look like and so in camden we've set up a think and do space which is really like a poor person's conduit actually so that's one of the things that i no seriously it's uh what do people who cannot afford the the mm. fees for the conduit do to collaborate to co-create to be entrepreneurial so with the help of camden council we converted a disused cafe on our high on our high street a blighted uh, uh you know property and we created a community pop-up hub and the idea is is called think and do because everyone has to think and do something differently and everyone is a strategist and everyone is a doer and it's countering some of the elitism frankly that is embedded in the way that we think about the world and which we think change makers and thought leaders come as if you know ordinary people aren't thought leaders in their own lives and i think the left the progressive left and certainly the climate movement has not met people where they are and that's why you know campaign after campaign has failed because it's been cooked up you know by people who are very removed from the daily realities of high streets of knife crime of job anxiety of the the difficulties of getting rent so i think some of these discussions are only possible when you meet people where they are and you start to convert uh disused empty premises even if they're available once a week twice a week for 6 months 3 months and convert them into little imagination laboratories and you start to collaboratively work out what you should think and do in any locality so we're committed to experimenting and rolling this out across Camden and I'd love to have a I think love- and do space in Selfridges one day I think I was just thinking <laughs> that myself why not absolutely Yeah, that sounds great. We were going to have a paint model, but COVID came along. So our first uh, experiment was going to be uh, a think and do hub in Tate Modern, you know, because we wanted to bring the artistic community and audiences together. So um, let's talk. Let's talk. Um actually that brings me to a question that one of our listeners has um asked. Emma asks to everyone, um in a world of increasing financial disparity, will activism against climate change be a catalyst for bringing all levels of society together christiana oh sorry um it better was my was my answer there's no guarantee but as we have all discussed the fact is that uh the crises that we're all now experiencing whether it is the health crisis the economic the biodiversity the climate change crisis all of that um we didn't ask them to converge upon us in 2020 but they have and the only way out is to converge the solution so i totally agree with uh with with john uh, on on that that we have to make them converge and Let's not forget that all of those crises have the undercurrent of inequality every single one of them. They all exacerbate inequality and they all magnify and they're all affected by um by inequality. So it's a two-way street. And until we understand that all of this is interlinked and that we can and we must address it as a whole package as an integrated whole we're simply going to be chasing our tails here constantly chasing our tails mm-hmm. and eluding the catching of the tail because yeah. it will be pulled away by you know some other crisis so um i'm hoping that 2020 is yes the first few months were called the great pause um i'm hoping that by the time we get to the end of the of the um year that we're actually going to be able to remember 2020 as the great reset the year in which we reset the way we do everything the way we produce food the way we um take decisions moving much more into community strength and community wisdom as farhana has said in the way that we produce and distribute food the way that paul has said the, the way that we transport ourselves the the way that the way that we vote and how how often we vote the way that investments are made and we haven't talked about finance here but honestly 
the finance sector has a huge, huge lever here because wherever where, wherever finance goes, there go emissions or emission reductions. So there is a huge space here for everyone who can decide on investment, whether that is small or big. And, you know, as we've heard, you buy one thing, you're an activist. You invest $2, two pounds into your savings account. Where is that? Where is that money? So there are many, many different ways in which all of us can get involved. And the point is, we have to, and we have to get involved in an integrated fashion, call it the surround sound um, solution, because it has to come from everywhere. We have to be able to put on carbon intensity glasses all the time and see where is their carbon intensity and how do I eliminate that carbon intensity from my life, from my community, from the country, from the economy? We've got to eliminate that carbon intensity. Mm -hmm. I've got a couple of questions here. I'll blend them together but because they're both about what business can do um, and how business leaders can work together to galvanize grassroots and policymakers. Um, who wants to take that? Um, Paul, how can business uh, galvanize change? Well, I think business first has to um, accept that it's necessary. Um, but then once it does, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think that um, in each of the sectors, so I think, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not just saying it to be polite, but I think Selfridges has been an incredible example of that, to be able to sit down and say, we want to send a legitimate signal that fashion needs to be more sustainable. So in what ways can we do so? We don't want to just do a sprinkling of a little bit of a cause. We want to think about it in an integrated way. We want to try and support as many sustainable brands as possible. We want to think about our carbon footprint. We want to support innovation in the supply chain and the material science and how things are sold and distributed. And if you take you as a microcosm, every analogous business can start thinking about its role. And you know, as a business person myself, when we set up the conduit, we said, okay, we've got a 40,000 square foot building in the heart of Mayfair. How do we retrofit it in a way that's consistent with our values? How do we pay our staff in a way that's consistent with our values? How do we do our sourcing in a way that's consistent with our values? How do we catalyze investment amongst our community so that when an entrepreneur has a great startup idea, I can connect that person to somebody who can invest. And then a person wants to volunteer and mentor, how do I do it? And I use those examples because I think if you begin with intention and then you're purposeful and authentic and creative, the world's your oyster in terms of the ways in which you can galvanize. I mean, you still have to be attentive to your bottom line and you have to you're a business, you have to think about those things. But there is an enormous amount of fertility in the world right now to align profit and purpose that's good for your business. And uh, as I keep saying, much more fundamentally good for your soul. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's, that, that's inspiring. Isn't it, isn't it about creative systems thinking? Because, because we, one thing COVID's shown us is how interconnected we all are, and that's been well documented. But, but, but I'm always amazed at how people don't see how problems are connected too. So problems in obesity are you know, connected, can be connected with problems of food supply, which can be connected with problems of waste, which could be connected with problems of transportation, which could be... So, so all, all of these things, if we could see them in the round, whether we're policymakers or business people. I mean, waste is, is a massive thing for business people, but they don't necessarily always look at, at um, sustainability as a, way, as a way to solve that, whether it's, you know, I don't know, their trucks and how many trips they do or, how, or their packaging. They don't necessarily see it that way. Um, John, have you got some good examples of, of how activism has brought about change across the system as opposed to something that's, that's very siloed? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that's one of the challenges along those, isn't it? Because so many of the costs are externalized. So, you know, people buying soya for animal feed uh, from Brazil, for example, has led to the destruction of the Amazon or Cerrado or whatever, or, you know, as most of the, you know, meat from the industrial meat that we buy in this country and supermarkets and fast food 
uh, joints comes from a, a very corrupt Brazilian uh, company, uh, which is one of the leading drivers of deforestation in the Amazon. And the, the, the reason why is because it's cheap and all the all the costs associated with it in terms of climate change, biodiversity loss, even, even the risks of, of, of pandemics, of course, these companies are not paying any of those costs. You know, ultimately, we're paying it in terms of climate change or we're paying it in terms of the health bills and so on and so forth. So I think to a certain extent, those costs have got to be internalized. And I think that's also the reason why, at the end of the day, government action is so important because it's ultimately is regulation um, that you need. And if you're going to get businesses to change, you're only going to do that in the absence of regulation if you can really put pressure on them. So I suppose the pressure that has been brought to bear on the fossil fuel industry, which was very powerful and thought they were untouchable, has actually been incredibly intense when you look at everything that's been going on from scientists, from activists, uh, from people involved in the investment community. You know, it's, it's, they've been under, under really intense pressure to change and change at a systemic level. And if they don't, I think now they can see the writing on the wall in terms of they may not have a business. And they're certainly seeing the writing on the wall in terms of their share price having collapsed. So I think you are beginning to see systemic change there. But I think in other places, you've seen disruptors come along. You know, you've, mm. you've seen like the Teslas of this world has disrupted an entire global car industry. And it doesn't actually even make or sell that many cars, and it's, but it's done a huge amount of damage to companies that, that thought the internal combustion engine would never end. And I think when it comes, because I, I think, you know, moving from a meat to a plant-based diet is an absolute necessity. We cannot solve the climate or the biodiversity or even the pandemic problems without doing that. How that is going to happen, we need in a way, the same disruptive elements coming in uh, to deal with that. Now, some of that is around consumer behavior, I accept. Some of it is around a a cultural shift. Uh, But some of it is also um, around actually who are going to be the the great uh, um, uh, disruptors. And certainly, we're beginning to see elements of that, aren't they? Things like the Impossible Burger and things like that have garnered so much uh, attention uh, recently. But so I suppose in a way, you know, you have got different different levers here, uh, different things going on in different industries, uh, which is bringing about the systemic change. But ultimately, we have got to do this in a, in a way that is just. We've got to do this in a way that is providing uh, employment and, and equality. And I think that's also a very good news story. A lot of this, as Fahana said, is about localism and doing things locally. You put a solar panel on the roof of people's houses. You know, you can generate renewable energy at a local, national, regional level. Energy efficiency is all about your own buildings, making them more energy efficient. You can employ millions of people doing that. So I think a lot of these things, they do tick all the boxes, really. Yes. We do. And in the last thanks and in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to ask each of you very briefly, you know, is the ultimate aim of the activists to render themselves obsolete? And how <laughs> hopeful are each of you um, that you'll be out of a job by 2030? Uh, uh, Farhana, do you want to start? Well, um, my new phrase, apart from 2030 is a new 2050, is community is the new cop. Community is the new cop. So actually locating yourself in your community, understanding your physical impact on the people around you, not just your global, national, you know, sectoral impact is really key. And starting from there, which is an underinvested part in climate and activism generally, is really important. So I don't intend to phase my community approach out whatsoever. And, and one of the reasons I decided to put less of my time in the global negotiations you know, for, for the last two years is to develop that sense of community and to go and walk with that community. And I think it's the lovely African proverb, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go, uh, uh, um, go together, if you want to uh, you know, go, go together. So I think that that for me is, fundamental and should stay with us forever i don't intend to phase that one out and um and paul would you like to be out of a job no 
I mean, I think that uh, I think justice is a is a journey, and it's not a destination. And uh, and I think that it requires all of us to be constantly vigilant. And in that vigilance, we produce a more just and a more decent society and a more sustainable one. So we never we should never let our guard down. And hopefully, you have fun and joy and delight on the way. Um, but but I think you 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 have to keep being an activist always. And John, activist always. Well, I've recently seen photographs of uh, young men in the nineties being carried away by the police. So um, I, I I have a feeling if I live that long, that I'll probably be in one of those pictures in the future. <laughs> and Christiana, would you like to just walk on the beach and? And, um, and, 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 and and have no need for the work you do? Well, um, I, I would like to do both, actually. I would like to walk on the beach um, to nourish myself, but I think we're all of one voice here. The fact is that uh, justice, peace, equality are gratefully, gratefully, they are targets that we have to constantly strive for. And I don't think that we will reach nirvana state on any of them anytime soon, which only keeps us, you know, with our nose to the, to, to the grind. And um, it's, it's a wonderful journey. We are constantly on that journey. And along that journey, we do have to take the time to celebrate the little achievements that we do have, because otherwise this seems like a non-ending, you know, like a string or a rubber band that you stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch and you don't get any sense of its, um, uh, of its strength. We have to take time to celebrate little victories. And there are many little victories along the way at the personal level, at the community level, family level, country level, even at the global level, there are many little victories. And the destination or the path is the sum total. The path is the sum total of all of those little milestones that we reach along the way. So it is not about packing up and saying we're done. It's about saying we are still in. We are still there. Well, I can't think of a better way to end this conversation. I want to thank all of you for participating. I want to thank all of you for the work you've done um, as veterans of this space over the last 30 years. And, um, and I'm so looking forward to seeing all that you do in the future. And, um, and, and we're right there with you. And I know so are um, the people listening uh, tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much. And good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.